only usually about getting a dysfunctional family under one it's happened before is that would so be on Facebook if actually some of them are on Facebook now it's really embarrassing I don't want to be here I mean I love my grandpa he's the best but some of the rest of them I don't care for much like her <laughs> that's my dad right there but that's not my mom that's dad's third wife my mom was his second <sighs> Jillian's not all that much older than me some call her dad's trophy wife but my mom Julie she took first place she was the prize but I guess dad didn't think so oh and that's my brother Andrew half brother actually from dad's first wife Joan Joanna, I don't know. Let's just say he's into the Jays. Anyways, when she left Dad, she left Andrew behind too, but then changed her mind when she got remarried. They've been fighting for custody ever since. Then last year, when my mom got sick and died, Dad got custody of me too. Now he's married again, and she wants us all to be one big happy family. Like that's going to happen. Oh man, she's coming over here. Sorry, I'm the lookout for when Grandpa gets here. I gotta go. I'm Walter Braden, the family patriarch. Collectively, my family probably holds more baggage than Midway Airport on Christmas Eve. Today, my kids and their families are throwing me a surprise party for my birthday. I've been sitting in the car watching my kids get ready to surprise me. They surprised me on my 65th and every five years after that. Now they've switched to treating my birthdays like the DMV treats driver's license renewals for the elderly, <laughs> requiring it every year. An annual road test, eye exam, surprise party, and you're good to go. My kids think these parties are surprises, but they're about as surprising as the other secrets they've tried to hide over the years. Just because I love my kids unconditionally doesn't mean I don't know what they struggle with. My oldest son, Stephen, has been in more relationships than Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> and now he's married again. From the looks of it, my grandkids aren't too happy about it. I wonder if his sisters know about his new wife. This will be interesting to watch. Peter, my second son, will be late again if they even show up. His wife is a tornado on wheels. Good heart, though. Their two boys are Marines stationed overseas. My third son, Thomas, was a twin. Uh, he's not with us anymore. He left behind a girlfriend and a, a brand new baby when he was only 22 years old. I took Melinda and the baby in, and they became like daughters to me. So much, in fact, that I adopted my granddaughter, Christine, to give her the Braden name and a more stable home. My oldest daughter, Leanne, was Thomas's twin. Leanne, Thomas, Melinda, and Leanne's husband, Matthew, used to be inseparable. Leanne, once an aspiring chef, loves to cook with wine. <laughs> Sometimes she even adds food to it. Her husband, Matthew, is in jail. Our family never talks about that night. Actually, there's a lot of nights we don't talk about. One of the few things that keeps Leanne from falling completely into the sauce is her daughter and son-in-law and her three beautiful grandchildren. My second daughter, Peggy, is my easy one. She and her husband, George, and their two daughters might seem like the normal ones, which makes them abnormal in this family. Peggy may be my fifth child, but she's the most responsible of them all, much to the annoyance of their siblings. I must admit, sometimes Peggy does need to lighten up. The baby of my family is my youngest daughter, Kathy, who was a real surprise child. I was almost 50 years old when she was born. I guess we spoiled her too much because she's never really been able to deal with life's heartaches and disappointments. I've always thanked God for her husband, Alan. He's got the patience of a saint.
My family now live in all walks of life, sometimes are at different stages in their walk with God, and some have yet to begin that walk. Sometimes you can't tell the difference between them. Not judging them, mind you, but my family can wear a man's knees out. You may have noticed I haven't mentioned my wife, Millie. I met this beautiful cabaret singer shortly after getting back from World War II. Next thing I know, she and I are married with a mortgage, a really successful career, and a house full of kids. But our marriage was a rocky road from the get-go. What we put our kids through. Suddenly, Millie starts going to a neighborhood Bible study, and one night she comes home and announces she's decided to follow Jesus. I resisted her newfound faith for a long time, but Millie kept a praying and God kept a calling, and one day I finally said, yes, Lord, oh, yes. One of my younger kids embraced the Lord right away. A couple made professions of faith but fell away, and some, well, some need a lot of prayer. My Millie's gone for more than 30 years now, and I miss her every day. Before I met the Lord, I spent many a week sowing wild oats. Now I'm into shredded wheat and prunes. <laughs> I wish I could have been a better husband to her and a better father to our children earlier. I know I've made plenty of mistakes with my family, as did my parents and their parents before them, all the way back to the first family, Adam and Eve. Like I said, we've got baggage. But family is God's training gown to prepare us to be more like Christ. And I'm praying and trusting God to work miracles in the lives of these people I love. So, it's time for you to meet my family, the Bradens. Here we go. Hi, Grandpa. Oh, thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. Okay, everybody, here he comes. Surprise! <laughs> I had no idea. What a family, huh? Yeah. Chad, there should be a song that goes with that, shouldn't there? I, I mean, the Braden family, wasn't there a song that goes with that? Thanks. I think we'll hear and see this family a little bit more during this series. So uh, you're going to want to come back not only to hear the Word of God and what God has to say about relationships, you're going to want to hear and see pictured out in these sketches in this family a little bit how God's Word works out. So... We'll be seeing more from that family as weeks go on. Because, you know, uh, relationships can be messy. Anybody here ever been in a messy relationship? Yeah, some put them up pretty quick and fit high. <laughs> Hopefully it's not with the person you're sitting next to. Uh, but we know relationships can be messy. And I'm not just talking about marriage. I, I, I'm not just talking about marriage. They can be messy at every level. Could it have to do with friends? Could it have to do with coworkers? Could it have to do with classmates, neighbors, brothers and sisters, moms and dads, children, children with mom and dad, siblings, brothers and sisters, even sometimes brothers and sisters in Christ. <laughs> in a local community, relationships can get messy. And as we saw in this sketch, we're deeply deeply tied together with one another. Whether we like it or not, or whether we chose that relationship or not. Do you realize we're all in relationships we didn't choose? Did you know you didn't choose the family you would be born into? Sorry, Sharissa, Chelsea, I know Courtney isn't here today, but yeah, you guys, you're stuck with us. That's who you were born into. You didn't have no choice in that. And you know what? We're born into the country. And many of us have been very blessed because we've been born in the United States. 
But you know what? There's also some spiritual non-blessings about being in the United States and the prosperity sometimes can bring some things that aren't good for our hearts. You know what? We didn't even choose the children that would be born to us. You know, as parents, you've got to learn to love and adjust to who God gives you in whatever form he gives them to you. So we don't always choose the relationships we're in. But there are some relationships we've chosen. We've chosen the person we'd marry. We chose the church we go to. And no matter whether we're in a relationship that we did not choose or whether we're in a relationship we chose, the reality is we are tied together. And what I do and what you do and the way that I do it, and the way that you do it, and as we walk in relationship, with her, we really do have an impact upon one another. And the problem is, is that we're all broken people. <laughs> Living in a broken world. And so we got broken people who've been broken by sin, living in a broken world that's been damaged by sin, and we get together and we create messes, and we create deep messes, and we create more and more messes in our relationships. See, by nature, a relationship takes more than one person, so I'm not talking about your own personal life and how you live your life. I'm talking about how your life relates with the people around you and the different relationship settings that you're in. So by nature, relationships take more than one person, and they talk about the way we relate and interact with one another. So what I want to do this morning in introducing this series is I want to take some time to give you an overview of what God says in his word. He's revealed to us about relationships. I'm not going to take a particular text. I'm trying to use the big picture story of the whole Bible and what God is saying so you won't be looking at particular texts uh, we, we will have one or two throughout, but we're going to take a look at the Bible and what does God say about relationships. And then after that, I just want to tell you a little bit about the series of what's coming up and how you can best gain from this opportunity that's in front of you as we go through this series. Let me start with prayer. Would you pray with me? Father, I long so much this would just not be another Sunday where we come to church, we hear a message, we take some notes, we close the book, we put the flyer in there and we go home and then we open it up again next Sunday. God, I long so much that the Holy Spirit would write your truth upon our hearts. I long so much, and God, I do say ours. It's not like me out there teaching the people. <laughs> God, we're looking together into your story, into your word, and we all need to be transformed. We all need your word to enter into our hearts, Lord, and replace the ways of thinking that are contrary to your truth, whether they came from the world, the devil, or the flesh. God, I just long that your Holy Spirit would rest upon us today as we look into your word. And God, that you will do things that only God in his word can do in us. God, I pray that today would be life transformation and not just information. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. So what does this book say about relationships? Again, this is a brief overview, but if we understand relationships from a biblical perspective, we understand that relationships start with God. Matter of fact, the first relationship was God. God is a triune God. That means one God, three persons. So in eternity past, God was interrelating between Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in relationship. By nature, more than one. And it's about interrelating with one another. And so all relationship, the whole idea of relationship, the whole place where it started is in the triune God in the fact of their relationship and interaction with one another. Well, at the beginning of time as we know it, God created man and woman. And we are created in his image, the Bible says. 
So if we're created in God's image, that means we were created with a relational part and makeup to us. Just as God in his image is a God of relationships, he made us in his image to be a people who live in relationship with others and interact with more than just one person ourselves as individuals. And we're created in this relationship by God in a perfect state, unaffected by sin. And so what happened is, is that man at that time, man and woman, Adam and Eve, were in a perfect relationship with God, one that was, nothing was hidden between them and God, and they walked in a perfect relationship. They walked in a perfect relationship with one another, and nothing was hidden, everything was open, everything was honest, nothing was tainted by sin. But then sin came in. And sin damaged man and woman. And that damage brought a mess and damage, depravity, as we call it in theology circles, between God and man, man and himself, and man and his relationship with others. And when I say man, I'm using man generically for mankind, man and woman. And so sin brought damage in. And sin did something to us as individuals. It did something to the individuals we interact with and the way we interact with one another. It did something to us in the way we interact with God and the way we relate with him, the most important primary relationship that we have. And that brought messes. As you read the story of the Bible and you go on, you see mess after mess after mess that is created because of people's sins. And those messes are in relationship. Even the first mess was a brother who killed his brother uh, because of jealousy and envy. And you need to realize that this damage of sin not only impacted Adam and Eve, but because before they were parents and they were impacted by sin, their very image was stamped in the children that were born to them. So they gave birth to children that were in the image of God, but also in the image of Adam. And so they were born already damaged by sin. And so now you've got people born into the world throughout the thousands of years, all the way down to you and me, that were born damaged. And from day one, I know my daughter Courtney hates when I say it, but she's got her little angel of a daughter that she loves, and I say, she's a sinner. Look what that little sinner did, you know? And, you know, uh, she doesn't like to think of it that way. But uh, that, that's the reality. I love them too, and I love the pictures, and they're cute, but guys... We're all damaged from birth. You can be a cute sinner, you know, <laughs> but we're all damaged. And because of that damage, guess what? We do not operate the way God intended us to operate. What I mean is God designed us and created us to operate a certain way. And because of the sin, we do not operate the way we're intended to operate, nor do we operate the way that we were instructed by God and his word to operate. And so this damage is creating messes. We don't live as we were intended to. We don't live as we're instructed to. And we get mess after mess after mess. And with time, God gave a law. And this law was given for the very purpose to teach mankind how to walk with a holy God, but also how to walk and relate with mankind around them. You see, listen to what Jesus said about the law. Uh, put up Matthew 22 for me, Pete, would you? Uh, you know what? Maybe I didn't put it on a PowerPoint. Turn to Matthew 22. That's my fault. I didn't put it on a PowerPoint. Turn to Matthew 22. First book of the New Testament. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, we have them for you in the seats. Underneath where you're sitting, look on with somebody next to you. I want you to see what God's Word says here. Matthew, the very first book of the New Testament, chapter 22, verse 36. 
a lawyer was testing Jesus. He said, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and the foremost. This is the one with the greatest significance. This is the one that's first in rank over all the commands. And the second is like it, though. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands depends the whole law and prophets. What Jesus was saying is this. The whole Old Testament depends upon loving God with all you are and loving your neighbor as yourself. See, a lot of people, when they look at the law and they look at the Old Testament, they they look at it through legal eyes. (laughs) Jesus looked at it through the eyes of love. And Jesus says that these commands and these laws were given out of love to teach you how to love God and how to love man. And so this is what the whole Old Testament was about. This was the heart of it. And God gave us a law to teach us how to love him and how to love other people. And he says the second one is very close to the first one. It's, it's like it, he says. There's one that's like it. It's, it's very close. It's in second place, if you would. And that's the way we love one another. The first command is to love God. The second one of importance. The second one of significance. The second one in rank that's real close up there is the way that we love one another. This is what Jesus said. In a real sense, the way we love God and the way we love each other are directly tied together. And we cannot love each other properly if we're not loving God properly. Look at Colossians 1. I do have this one on PowerPoint. For by him, speaking of Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers and authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. We were created for a relationship with God through Jesus. That's why you and me have been created for a relationship, but for a relationship with God. And guys, if we have that off base and and, and we put that to the side as unimportant or we don't live it the way that God tells us to live it, guess what? All the other relationships are going to be off base and they're not going to be operating the way God intended them to operate. So you and I were created for a relationship with God first and foremost and of greatest significance. And when we get that in place, everything else follows in order in our relationship with each other, men and women, children, parents, mates, with our authorities, with our subordinates, whatever kind of relationship you want to talk about, they come in order when we get that relationship in order. Let me just give you a quick sidebar. We're North Americans. This is what our culture is about. Our culture is a task-oriented culture. It's a culture that is controlled by time. It is a culture that's goal-oriented. And many of you maybe haven't had the opportunity, like I have, to travel to other cultures that aren't made like this. There's relational cultures in the world. (laughs) Uh, North America is not one of them. We set as a value and a priority our time and how much time we have and what we got to do next, the goal of where we want to get to and to what we want to accomplish, the task that we got to do. And and this is my observation. You know what most North American Christians, I think, do? And I even see it in pastors. We read the Bible looking for a task. (laughs) We live the Christian life as if it's about a task, a goal, what God wants us to do. What do we do when we pray for God's will? Don't we pray, God, what do you want me to do? 
And we are so focused on doing and task and time and goals that I believe that in North America quite often we miss the very heart of what God's word is going afterwards and that is relationships. Because I think as you read God's word, watch with me because this is what has stuck out with for me. That the great bulk of scripture, the great bulk of commands had to do with relationships that we have not about things that God wants us to do. And when we read the scripture, we read about attitudes and the words we use and the impact it has on one, the dispositions of heart that we should have towards one another. The actions that we take have to do with how we can bless and relate and help others. And so the heart of the Bible is about loving God and loving people. And in North America, we turn it into something to do, a task to accomplish, a goal to reach, and we got so much time to do it as we set up time frames to our structures on how to live our Christian lives. Relationship is gigantic to God. It's gigantic to the Word of God. It's gigantic for the very reason of why we were created. And over time, as God wrote out for man in the Old Testament law, <laughs> how to love God and how to love others, we proved, <laughs> man proved, we can't do it. <laughs> we can't live the way God intended us to live, and we can't live the way that God instructed us to live. And so man creates more and more messes for himself and others as we walk in sin, contrary to God's word. And then over time and many centuries of man walking, even getting to the point of creating religion that had the semblance of something that was godly, but was missing the whole point of God himself, God sent his son at just the right time. And Jesus... The God-man left the throne of heaven, came to earth, took on flesh, walked as a servant of God, loving God, loving man, laying down his life as a ransom for our sin. So Jesus came, the God-man, and he died on that cross for two reasons. One was to pay the price of my sin so I can be forgiven, so the penalty of sin could be removed, so I could what? Come into relationship with God. That's the whole purpose of salvation. And so Jesus removed the barrier between us and God so we can come into a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And the second thing he did on the cross is he broke the power of sin in our lives so that sin could not keep on tripping us up and creating more and more messes in our relationships. That's why Jesus came. That's why he died on the cross. He ascended back up to heaven. And what did he do? He sent the Holy Spirit to earth to be his representative while he is gone. And he came to live inside of every believer. And the Holy Spirit does two things. One of He does more than two, but these are the two I want to talk about today. First of all, he breaks down the control of sin in our life. I was reading last night. I love it. I never saw this before. So I was reading in Romans, and it talks about when Jesus will return. Maybe I should save it for later in the sermon, but it's coming up now. It says this. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And you know what? It's the Holy Spirit that removes the ungodliness from us, that breaks down the power of this in our lives. And we are so busy trying to get better for God when the way we need to do it is submit to the person of the Holy Spirit and say, God, I'm a mess. And sin has created messes. I know I'm forgiven, but I'm still inseparably linked to this flesh that does crazy things and creates messes in relationships. And I just open myself to you, and I want to trust the Spirit of God to break down the flesh in my life and the impact of sin and to build into me the very life of the resurrected Jesus Christ. Remember the fruit of the Spirit? It's all about relationships, isn't it? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, 
I, I don't remember them all in order, but gentleness, uh, you guys know them. Why, why am I even repeating? You guys already know them. Why should I waste my time doing it? No. <laughs> you can see I messed that up. But you can see most of them have to do with relationships. And the Spirit of God is working in us to destroy all that junk that destroys relationships and sin as it works out. And he's building within us the very life of Jesus so that we can gradually live more and more the way God intended us to live and the way that God instructed us to live. But it's gradual. And it's, it, it's over time. And, and it kind of, as God, as the Spirit of God is working in my life, if I'm submitting to Him and opening to Him and trust Him to do this work, what should be happening is there becomes a little bit less of Pat Peglow every day and a little bit more of Jesus. As the Spirit of God removes a little bit more of the junk in Pat Peglow's life and breaks that down, there's a little bit more space in my life for the Spirit of God to manifest the life of Jesus through me. So that's what's going on right now. And then Jesus is going to return someday in the future. Right now, until he returns, we're in that state where we're forgiven, but we're inseparably linked to a fallen flesh. So we still find messes. But by God's grace, they're becoming less and less as we walk with him. But there's a time coming when Jesus, who went back, right now the representative on earth is the Holy Spirit, he's going to come back and he's going to reign as king on earth. And then he's going to set up an eternal kingdom. And at that time, he's going to bring an end to sin. See, on the cross... He paid the penalty for sin. Today, in the means of his spirit, he's breaking the power of sin in our lives. But in the future, he's going to remove us from the presence of sin. And when sin is removed, guess what? The cause of all our messes are removed. And we'll be living in a state forever, perfectly, the way God intended us to live and the way that God instructed us to live. But until then, that's what this series is about. <laughs> How do we live until then? Because we know we're in some messes. And even though we know Jesus, many of us, and maybe most of us, we know that even as believers in Christ, who have still at times been deceived and tripped up and have sinned, we got messes that we're in. How do we live between now and then? And that's what this series is going to be about. How do we live in relationship? I hope I can jumpstart you and uh, prime the pump. Uh, I certainly don't have everything that needs to be said on relationships, uh, but, but I'm hoping to bring some things to you that'll be very helpful. So this series is gonna run in two parts. The first part is gonna be about, if you have a flyer, look on the back. I, I did list the details of the series for you, for you. The first part is going to be up until basically Thanksgiving time is going to be about relationships in general and different things in relationships that, that impact us, whether we're married, single, divorced, widowed, young, you know, whatever would be the case. The second part of the series after the New Year's is going to do with um, marriage. I'm going to talk specifically about marriage for six weeks and some of the things that relate to married people. And in between, we're gonna do two things. As we celebrate the holidays, uh, something that's been on my heart for this particular uh, Christmas season is, is uh, that we kind of take a look at some of the Christmas carols and the theology behind them. You know, these Christmas carols were written, uh, many of them based upon God's word. Guess what? I, I, I give sermons that I trust are based on God's word. Well, those who wrote the Christmas carols wrote carols based, so they sing them in a real nice way. I speak them with a real rough voice. You know, they, they got pretty voices to sing those carols. So I want to look at some of the theology behind that, get some help from my friends. Uh, Chad and Clem are going to help me out with that, and we're going to take a look at some of these carols and say, oh, well, what do we learn about God? As we look at the theology, it comes from those and drive us back to the Word of God. First week of January, Pastor Bill Mills is actually going to do a one-day conference with us in the morning and the evening on a gospel that's worthy of our lives. 
And then again, like I said, we'll come back after that to take a look at marriage in particular. So that's kind of where this is going. One thing I'm hoping for, and you can help me with, are some testimonies. As you look at the ones that are on there that we're going to be talking about, maybe your life is a story of God's grace that we could share with others. I, I would really like to know. Or maybe you know somebody else. Here you say, you know what, their life would really fit. Give me a call. Because I would love to have some real flesh and blood stories up here from people in the body that can say, you know what, that's my story. I'd love to share it with this body. So let me know if you have a story or you know somebody that fits one of those topics that we'll be looking at on those days. I encourage you to take this flyer, put it on your refrigerator at home. And you know, I'm going to also encourage you to invite some friends. Everybody in this world lives in relationships. Everybody in this world needs to know what God has to say about that. I encourage you to invite some friends to come to the series. Now you need to know as I go through this series, my desire is not to give you a marriage conference. There's a lot of good marriage conferences out there. I'm not trying to compete with them. And my goal is not to give you uh, information as if you went to a marriage or relationship conference, what that would look like. That, I don't feel that's what my call is. I'm not here to be the relationship doctor. I'm not going to try to be a little Dr. Phil. I think Dr. Phil's got some good wisdom. Uh, whenever it matches what God's word says, uh, I think he got some good practical handles on that at times. But my calling is different. My purpose, what God intended for Pat Peglow to be, I think it's well said by a guy named uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Bob, thanks for this book. Preaching and Preachers. He said this, things like medicine, the state, psychology, and various other teachings and political agencies are all designed to help and to relieve somewhat the human condition to ease the pain and the problem of life and to enable men to live more harmoniously and to enjoy life in a greater measure. They are capable. You know, I think sometimes we, we, we talk down anything that's other, you know, these are some of God's general graces. And they are capable in a measure <laughs> of dealing with these things. But none of them can deal with the fundamental problem of sin Guys, we just talked about, from God's perspective, about relationships. You can get a lot of practical helps, and you see, part of my heart is this. We can teach you how to communicate better, but if you've got sin controlling your heart, it doesn't matter. You know, you're trying to frustrate, trying to you know, lock down these words so I don't say them. Guess what? If your heart's cleaned up, what's going to come out of your mouth is real good. You may not say it the best way, but when you start pouring blessings on people, so you see, my heart is to get down to the things that are foundational from God's perspective, the things that these other general graces of God cannot deal with to bring for you from God's word, God's perspective on what he can do. And so they're capable, but none of them can deal with the fundamental problem of sin and the solution in Jesus Christ. I assert, this is what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, and I agree, I assert that it is the peculiar task of the church and of the preacher to make all of this known. See, I'm called not to teach a conference on marriage. I'm called not to do the Dr. Phil kind of thing. I'm called to bring God's perspective on relationships and God's word on it. See, I believe, and I don't have time this morning, and maybe during the series I'll share with this, because Kim and I came to the place we realized this. We met with God all the time. We were, we were walking with quiet times. You know, we're doing all the spiritual things and really seeking God and, and enjoying God. But you know what? Our relationship was drifting apart. It really was. And we went to a conference that was for pastors and their wives regarding marriage. And they talked not about the fundamental things, but some of the skill stuff that was there. And you know what? Kim and I realized we may have good hearts and we may be getting in God's word. We may be walking with Jesus, but you know, there's some skills that can help. <laughs> and when we learned some of those skills of marriage in this conference, it was very helpful. So I believe to have a cutting edge relationship, you need three things. 
Why do you need to have a relationship that is directed by God's word? What does God say in his word about relationships? How does he say they're supposed to operate? Getting my input from God and not from the world, not from the media, not from my friends, and not what I see from others. What does God say about relationships? That's the first thing to have a cutting edge relationship. The second thing is this, to rely upon the spirit of God who now lives in us to give me the ability to live the way that God directed me to live in his word. But the third thing is, is I think, to know and to use the helps and the skills that are available. So to have a cutting edge relationship, first and foremost, these are the primaries, these are the hearts, God's word and God's spirit. But thirdly, Still important, maybe not as vital as the other two, but very important, is that we know the skills on how to live in relationship. So what we're going to do in this series is not only am I going to preach the vitals on Sunday morning, but we hope to provide some of the important skills for you also along the way through second hour pathways, through evening classes through certain events that may take place. You know, you have a flyer in your bulletin this morning that talks about pathway classes. I hope that you're going to some. Great opportunity to continue to grow in the Lord and to understand what his word has to say and how he directs us. But I want to just talk about a few in particular that have to do that we set up particularly for the relationship aspect to give you some extra skills. They start this morning. First of all is boundaries. It's gonna be in room 102. This is a class that teaches you when to say yes and how to say no. A lot of people struggle with that. We really need healthy boundaries and relationships. Actually, we're fortunate to have Henry Cloud and John Townsend on video to share with us. These are guys who have given their life to understanding these things. They're going to give us a biblically-based uh, means on how to set boundaries with parents, with spouses, with children, with friends, with co-workers, even with ourselves. And they're even going to uh, spend some time talking about abusive relationships and how that impacts. This is, this is one of those classes we set up specifically so people can get some of those skills on how to live relationship. You want to have a cutting relationship, don't just know what God's word is. Also know some of the skills that go along with it so that you can apply that in boundaries, one of them. Ava Perry and Kathy Gertler are going to teach that. Uh, These are two of the ladies that I know that are just awesomely gifted counselors. Uh, Ava's on the staff, but also very gifted in counseling. Kathy's a professional counselor, and uh, we're excited to have them with us to do that, to facilitate that series. Kim and I, along with Ed and Carolyn Sarna, Ed and Carolyn actually oversee the marriage ministry here at Moraine Valley Church and so many aspects of what goes on there. They've had a lot of experience in uh, getting up close and dealing with people in uh, marriage crisis as well as helping people plan marriage. Kim and I, as a pastor and wife, have had the same. We're going to do a class called Diving Deeper. Basically, we're going to take the topic of whatever that particular Sunday is, and we're going to dive deeper. We may have a little extra teaching with it, but what we're also going to do is we're going to uh, answer questions. Uh, We're going to, uh, you know, the kind of stuff, maybe some things aren't appropriate to talk about on the pulpit, but when we get in behind those closed doors, there may be some kind of questions to say we got to talk about. So that's what we want to do in that one. There's there's going to be a, a less structured Uh, kind of class we can interact and wrestle with the things we're hearing. This fall we're going to offer a video series by Gary Thomas called Sacred Marriage. Gary Thomas changed my whole theology of marriage when I uh, saw a blurb for a conference I was going to that just explained his class and he said this, what if God designed marriage to make you holy rather than happy. (laughs) North America, we all want to be happy, and I want to be happy. 
But God's ultimate goal with marriage is not to make us happy, it's to make us holy. And this video series by Gary Thomas, which Ed and Carolyn are going to oversee, be offered this fall, are going to help you understand that. Another uh, class this winter, Steve and Mary are going to be offering for us uh, Gary Chapman. You may have heard him on Moody. Uh, does a special uh, conference called Towards a Growing Marriage. And you know, one thing you may not know, Steve works for Moody Publishing, and he's Moody's representative to travel uh, with Gary. And so uh, Steve knows him well, but he's obviously he's been through this teaching and interacted with Gary so many times personally on it. And he and Mary are going to take a uh, recent uh, Towards a Growing Marriage conference that uh, Gary did up at Wheaton Bible Church that they've put on DVD, and they're going to walk us through. So in the wintertime, in the Pathway class, you'll have an opportunity to do that. One other opportunity you have in front of you in the Pathway sense is we have some uh, weeknight classes. One in particular, I think it's important to uh, couples, is financial peace. Do you realize that one of the top reasons why people get divorced has to do with money issues? And financial peace is designed to teach you how to handle your money, how, how to save it, how to get out of debt, how to budget, you know, all these practical things. And I'd encourage you uh, to uh, seriously take a look at being a part of that. You can see all of these things in the What's Happening, the flyer. We're going to offer this fall. We want to offer a special event for younger couples and singles, a place where you can get to hang out and get to know one another a little bit better. We're still in the process of trying to create exactly what that looked like. We're going to offer that event this fall. And then in the winter, we're going to offer a one-day marriage conference here at Moraine Valley Church. Uh, we're going to do it in a way that's affordable for people, but very helpful for their marriages. So those are some of the things we're offering. Hoping to start some small groups, specifically about some of the different relationship things that are there. That's going to come if enough of you say, man, I need more of this, and I got an interest in that. We can put some couples together that can grow together, give you some material to help you with that. In fact, we're going to offer some tests. Um, you've heard of Prepare and Rich. Many of our young couples take that in preparation for marriage. They take the prepare portion. Did you know there's an enrich portion to that same testing? And the enrich portion, and what they, is for marriages. And they have people that are second marriages, people are, that have been married just once, people that, you know, have been widowed. They got to divide in many different ways. And when you take this, it helps you understand the areas that you're strong in as a couple, but the areas that you probably should give some attention to to help you to excel still the more in your marriage. And so uh, that's available. I think it costs $35 to take that test. Uh, we're going to get all this information to you in weeks to come on where you can do that. But this is tremendous things to help you in your relationship and ways to grow. We're going to offer a one-day class after uh, the time frame closes for that test that will help you understand the results better for you. Then just one other test we're offering. doesn't matter if you're married or not. I would encourage both married and singles to take. It's called Thinking Preferences. It helps you understand how you think. I took this test. You know, like a lot of I think, ah, oh, this is a bunch of stuff, man. You know, this is, this is crazy. But when I took the test and got the results back, man, I read, I was like, man, it opened a whole new world for me. <laughs> and you know what? I understood why Kim thinks the way that she thinks now. And you know, for a man to understand a little bit about the way his wife thinks is just an awesome thing. So take this test, guys, you know, instantly. But you know what? It helped her understand the way I think. <laughs> and you know what? It, I tell you the other thing. Help, help me understand why a lot of my staff members act the way they do. And for those who took it, begin to understand why I act the way I do. Some don't even understand, and some of us don't even understand why we act the way we do. There's a way God made us. And this thinking preference test, there's no cost for this one. You don't, they'll give you the results back. And as you look at it, you're going to begin to understand some things about yourself and about the people you're interacting with and the way that God made you in your general bend and how you work together. It's an awesome test. Encourage everybody in the church to take it. It will help you in your relationships. You say, how's it going to help? This is how. Proverbs 33. No, Proverbs 14.33 says this. 
Wisdom rests in the heart of the one who has understanding. Let me give it to you in the New Living Translation version. Wisdom is enshrined in an understanding heart. The message says it like this. Lady wisdom is at home in an understanding heart. You know, guys, understanding is crucial to being wise. Wise simply means the Hebrew word for wise is skill. It's the skill of living life well. We all want to be wise. We want to be wise in our relationships, in the many different relationships we have. We want to be wise in so many ways. But you know what, guys? You can't be wise without understanding. If you have understanding, guess what? Wisdom will be right in the middle of it. It'll become obvious. It resides right there. And as we understand more about ourselves, more about the people we interact with, more about what God's Word says, whether it's through a pathway class, whether it's through a test, whether it's through a small group, doesn't matter what it is. Guys, we need to understand more of God and His ways and ourselves. And the more we understand, the wiser we'll be. And so this is what I want to close with. I want to close with this. Tell you there's an opportunity in front of you the next number of months to understand a lot of things. To understand the vitals from God's word and his spirit. To understand the important by the skills that will be offered in these different ways. I encourage you to plug into it, these opportunities. Guys, don't just go to church and kind of do your thing and go home. It's an opportunity to become wise, understanding. Listen, you know, Paul wrote something to the Thessalonian church that reminds me of a church much like Moraine Valley Church. People that love God, love people, uh, were doing a great work for God, and this is what Paul said to them. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need of anyone to write to you. In a sense, you have no need of anybody to preach to you. If you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, you know that. You know God wants us to love one another. I don't need to tell you that. And for indeed, you do practice it towards all the brethren who are in all Macedonia and all of Moraine Valley. You guys do. Moraine Valley Church is awesome. One of the strengths of Moraine Valley is the way you guys love each other, the way you minister to one another. But this is what Paul's exhortation was to Macedonia. This is God's exhortation to Moraine Valley Church. But we urge you, brethren and sisters, to excel still the more. Guys, don't be satisfied with saying, eh, I have my quiet time, I'm, I'm doing okay. Guys, until Jesus returns, we should be longing to excel still the more. Not lagging behind in diligence, but fervent in spirit in our desire to know God, to know his word, to be wise and to walk with him. So as I close us this morning in prayer, and then we're going to have a chance to go out for a few minutes, have some coffee and donuts together right after I pray for us. And then for those who would, uh, during the second hour, this place is going to be open for prayer. Then Pastor Gary will lead in here. We're going to have pathway classes. The last 10, 15 minutes are going to pray. You've got a prayer sheet inside of your bulletin encourage you to take it home with you. Pray for it. It's the needs of our church. You know, I'll just take a second to say this. I, I'm taking longer this morning. I knew I would. I'm sorry, but I listened to a tape this week on prayer from Dr. Chow. He's the pastor of the church in Seoul, Korea. Uh, when you take his church, which is about 250,000 people, and their satellite churches come about to 750,000 people, and you look at all the ministries that come out of that church, it's unbelievable. And this is what he said at the end of the day. It blew me off my seat. Maybe it explains why that church has got ministry like that. He said he prays from three to five hours a day as the pastor. He has every staff member to pray three hours a day. And every, and by the way, every staff member, every elder, and everyone he's discipling, he has to pray three hours a day. And then every member of the church to pray one hour a day. What do you think Moraine Valley would look like 
If your pastor prayed three to five hours a day, every staff member, every elder, everyone we're discipling is praying three hours a day, and every member of the church is praying one hour a day, you think we might uh, have some ministries that touch the world around us? Guys, we need prayer. And I beg you, even if you can't stay today, pray for us. Take this home. Put it by yourself in your quiet times. Pray for Moraine Valley Church and the ministries here. We want God to be glorified. We want his word and his power to move out. So I just want to close in prayer for us. Let's go have some donuts and coffee. Come on back and pray in about 15 minutes. We'll see some of you in the classes. And you know what? We're going to keep on growing. We're going to keep on learning. We'll become wiser in our relationships. Hopefully it'll be less messes and God will get greater glory. So Father, I pray for us now. I want to pray the prayer of Paul in Philippians 1. That we might abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. That our love might abound in real knowledge and all discernment. Lord, that's what it says. And God, I pray that you would do that at Moraine Valley Church. God, we can have all the skills, but if we don't have the Spirit of God living his life out through us, God, the skills become hollow. So Lord, I I just pray that your Holy Spirit would be at home at Moraine Valley Church and its people. I pray that your Spirit would rest on us. God, he would rest on our hearts. He would fill our hearts. He would transform us. God, that we would become a church and a people whose relationships bring glory to you, whose relationships bring blessing rather than messes. God, we pray that during this series that you would be pleased to sanctify us, to change us, to teach us your ways. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.